Hello, I am Jess with Jess of the North. I am sitting down to start the part of the garden that I think a lot of people forget about. Uh, it's not marketed to you as something that's a reminder to do. Um, doing a fall and or winter garden is very dependent. So it's a little bit difficult to uh, push out to everybody and say, hey, this works in your region. Um, because your region is probably different from my region, or maybe you're here because you're also in Zone 4 and we're in a similar boat. Uh, in which case, welcome. I'm glad you're here. So the thing you are going to need if you're going to plan a fall or winter garden is to know when your first frost date is or your fall frost date. Uh, this is something that you can search. Uh, just put in your favorite browser average last frost date for my postal code. Um, so for me, the average of my fall frost date is 928. Um, my spring uh, final frost is like May 12th or something like that, May 6th, May 8th, somewhere around there. We usually, in my area, local gardeners say don't plant until after Mother's Day. So that is the the range that I'm in. I get an average of 120 days. And you'll notice that I'm being careful to use the term average. The dates you're given are all based on data. Uh, that's not to say that you couldn't get a sudden earlier frost. Um, you could get more time of fall weather before you get actual snow or frost. Um, it's kind of a, a gamble. Uh, I don't I don't really have a habit of gambling with anything except plants. Um, I have a video from earlier this season where I was gambling on my frost date for spring and I snuck things out earlier than I was supposed to because the forecast looked pretty safe and that one paid off. That was great. Um, I built a greenhouse so that I could hedge my bets a little bit better, um, have things that would survive uh, above 28 but around 32 degrees Fahrenheit um, because I want to have some fresh greens, some fresh root crops, uh, whatever I can get to grow and stay in the greenhouse. I want to treat that like my pantry over the winter and see how far I can push that envelope. So I searched my last average fall frost date um, and then from there I put it in a spreadsheet and I took common variety maturity dates. And I did that by tens. So I picked 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90. And I essentially set up an equation to take my fall frost date of 928, subtracting those amount of days, to tell me when I would need to start seeds that have that maturity date. So if I have a seed packet that tells me how long it takes for something to get to maturity. So for this daikon radish, it states the harvest will be in about 60 days. So I can look at my outdoor fall frost minus 60 days, and I needed to start these 730. Now, as of recording, today is August 7th, so I have missed that window. However, my greenhouse gives me about a, a month extra. So I've got about four weeks of wiggle room. So for 60 days for a daikon radish, when I need to start them in the greenhouse, is actually 827. So I've still got some time before I need to start these, about 20 days. Uh, so these are absolutely, I have this in order. Hold on. Ah. So what I did was I took those dates for my average fall frost date, using that as the, the barometer for the main garden, the, the outdoor garden beds. So I can still sneak some things in um, as anything below 50 days on my seed packets. I'll be able to start those and probably get something from them before my fall frost sneaks in. Um, worst case scenario, I can toss up some little hoops uh, and put up some row cover to offer a little bit of shelter if I start to get below 32 or 28. Um, and the fall, the frost fabric that I have gets me about 8 to 12 degrees, um, and I can double layer it 
and increase that temperature, but reduce the light that gets through. So there's, there's a trade off there, but it offers me flexibility on squeaking some crops through that I normally wouldn't be able to. So that covers the fall frost dates for the outdoor garden. I did the same thing, but for the greenhouse and I added, I added about a month to that. So in the cell next to the outdoor one, I put the average fall frost date for the greenhouse as 1026. Well, that's close enough to 28. I wasn't worried about it. Um, and I did the same thing. So I took that calendar date minus 30. I took that calendar date minus 40 and so on and so forth. So as of today, I can start seeds for the greenhouse for anything that needs 80 days or less for maturity. And then I'm guaranteed to get things to that maturity level by, or not guaranteed, it is much more likely that I will get things to that level by 1026 in the greenhouse. There's an issue with winter gardening that I think I don't always consider, um, or I didn't until this past winter, which was my first one using the greenhouse. Um, and I didn't start anything in the greenhouse until like the very end of October uh, into September. And not all of those things were mature by the time winter came around. So the first thing that most people think of that I first thought of was the cold temperatures. And while that is absolutely true, uh, there is definitely cold temperatures associated with winter, particularly in my region. Even if I don't have snow, I can definitely have cold temperatures, um, increased wind, dryness. Uh, it's just, uh, anyway, cold. Adding snow on top of that increases some moisture level. And in some ways, the snow sometimes acts as like an insulator for the earth, uh, helps that retain some moisture and maintain a temperature level. So the other consideration you should have is around light. So I can gain temperature in the greenhouse by putting up the frost fabric inside, um, putting up greenhouse poly on top of the garden beds, uh, and basically putting a greenhouse within a greenhouse. That will essentially move me another zone south. So instead of being zone four, my greenhouse will feel like it's in zone five. And in the garden beds, it would feel like it's in zone six. That's all very true. The consideration is that by 10 a.m. in the winter, it gets to be hot in the greenhouse. And if I am not working from home, which is not always a possibility, then I do not always have the opportunity to remove something like the greenhouse poly, uh, which isn't breathable, which means that I could use something like the uh, frost fabric because it is breathable, uh, but it'll still have light reduction coming through that frost fabric. So if I'm already getting light reduction through the polycarbonate that is the greenhouse, and then I'm adding a layer or two of the frost fabric to maintain temperatures in the bed because the greenhouse isn't heated, then I'm reducing that light even more. Um, when you are buying frost fabric, um, when you're buying polycarbonate, they tell you on the listing what the light reduction is. It's usually in percentages. Um, I think the polycarbonate is something like 10%, and I'm pretty sure the frost, frost fabric that I have is a heavyweight one, and the light reduction would be, I don't know, 20% or something. I'll need to look, put it on the screen. But so in the winter, if you were trying to grow things, like actively grow things, you have not only the cold temperatures to consider, which you can account for with things like the varieties you choose, um, the types of veggies that you're looking to grow which we'll get to because I have quite a few seed packets happening here. But you'll also need to consider your lighting. Um, so the reason that you want to start some of these things early is because by the time you reach the winter solstice, that is the trigger that it is the darkest part of the season. Um, your light is restricted even further. So I might get six hours of sun in the winter. I would need to double check that. Uh, six hours feels right, but I could be very wrong. Um, but I know it's usually dark when I'm on my way into work and it's dark when I'm on my way home. So it's uh, significantly less sun than I'm currently getting. So that's the other consideration for you if you're also going to be planting a winter garden. 
if you're just doing a fall garden because you don't have someplace under cover, that's also perfectly fine. Um, you know your area better than I do, and you will need to account for your area's fall frost date, whatever that average is. Um, you can always look at your 10 day forecast and see if you have something coming sooner or later, and you can throw a sheet over something if you are needing to protect it on a night that's it dipping down to like 32 degrees just at the frost area. Um, protect them for a night or two and you can squeak a little more time out of your garden. Um, those are a good way to get more from the season than just the warm season crops like tomatoes and cucumbers and squashes and whatever else. So it's a little bit crazy to be thinking about starting more seeds because right now my garden, much like everyone else's, is going a little bit bonkers. Um, and I am up to my ears in cherry tomatoes and cucumbers and the squashes are starting to ripen and there's, there's plenty to do. Um, but in another month or so, I will be clearing out a lot of the beds um, or preparing to clear out the beds. So um, I will go through my process for how I started or how I figured out what I wanted to grow. This is my second winter with the greenhouse. So this is still something that I am learning and figuring out. Um, but I think that you can probably benefit from seeing how I've got where I am um, and what I'm trying this year that I didn't try last year. The main thing I'm trying this year is starting things earlier because the greenhouse is built. And uh, this time last year, I was still, still putting it together. So progress. I essentially took out all of the packets that you see on the table. So every single container here I had taken out because they were things that fell into the cool season crop category. Um, those are going to be things that are usually root crops, um, radishes, turnips, carrots, uh, beets, um, also cold hardy greens. If you're not sure what a cold hardy green is, you can obviously perform a search on that. The other thing is that your seed packets often say if something is frost hardy um, or if it's bolt resistant. Uh, bolt resistant would be something you want for the summertime. Frost hardy is something you want in the winter. When something is frost hardy, it is usually hardy down to like 28. Um, if it's a tender annual, then it's only hardy down to 32. So something like this tatsoi, it's in the brassica family. That means that it is a cool season crop. It does better in cool temperatures. Um, but this one in particular is stating as being extremely cold tolerant. Um, so something like this, um, I've got several Asian greens in here, as well as um, some corn salad and mizuna and things that I, when I was starting to look at growing in the winter, they are things that I searched, well, which greens are the hardiest because it gets very cold. Um, and then the thing that I learned in the greenhouse last winter is that there are zones of warmth or coolness, um, kind of like you have warm spots or cool spots in your oven. Um, you, I have those in the greenhouse. So predictably, closer to the doors, it's cooler. Uh, closer to the center, it's warmer. So that's something that when I was planting my seeds and where I wanted to put things this year, I considered that. So I have a lot of seed packets and while I have a sizable greenhouse, it's not that sizable. Uh, so I had to narrow it down further. And the way that I chose to narrow this down further was to take an Excel sheet and I counted down 17 cells and I moved them three cells to the right, and then I made a second version of that. So the garden beds inside the greenhouse are 17 feet long by two and a half feet wide. So I approximated the greenhouse space that I have available to me so that I could list the varieties, one on each line. What that did is told me how limited my space was, and it only allowed me one crop per figurative foot in my Excel sheet. So uh, I tend to overstuff the garden beds, which I am 
not upset about and will absolutely continue to do. Uh, but with that in mind, I can start with them full. I can start more seeds than I need and I can harvest some things as baby crops, um, particular things like baby greens, um, baby lettuces, uh, that is a baby green. Anyway, um, I can harvest baby things to essentially thin things out. So um, I took that Excel sheet and I went through and I prioritized what I wanted because I had to consider the spaces. So what that did was I immediately rolled these out um, because several of them are either too long um, like this cabbage is my most beautiful cabbage that is currently in the main garden area. However, it has 90 days till maturity. So I took out things that were um, longer maturity times. Um, I took out things that were just going to take up more space than I needed. Or I have an orange chard that I'm leaving in here and I'll use just the red one for the winter because I think the bright color would be really satisfying to walk into when it is frigid and white everywhere else outside. And then some things I took out because they say that they would do better in the spring specifically. Um, I took out a salad blend because I'll have plenty of other kinds of salad greens, so I'm not worried about having one that's specifically a salad blend. Um, I'm sure it'll be delicious, but I'll do it later. So these are the things that immediately got removed. And then this was the container of things that I narrowed down. So what I was left with are these containers for the greenhouse and I split them up by bed. So this is my south bed, this is my north bed. And then these are the things that I can still succession sow outside. Um, including the peas. Um, I'm actually going to try growing the peas in a hanging basket. I've not done that before. It sounds like a good time. We're going to give it a go. Um, and then I've been struggling in particular with these tall telephone peas to get them to germinate and produce. So what I'm going to try to do, and I've started, is soak those in water. Um, I've got them split up by variety. So I've got the tall telephone soaking. And then I've got the sugar magnolia snap peas as well soaking. And I'm going to put them mixed together in hanging baskets in the greenhouse. And we're going to see what happens. Um, mostly because my hanging baskets died with the flowers that I had in them because the shepherd's hook kept tight. The shepherd's hook kept tipping over um, because when I watered it, it got too heavy. Um, so then I just forgot to water it because it wasn't where I could see it out of sight, out of mind. We've talked about this anyway. So I'm going to move it to the greenhouse, which I go into regularly. And I'm going to try and use peas in there, which I think would be interesting because normally you trellis them up and I want to see what happens if you make them go down. I've got bunch more beans I'm going to be doing outside. This seems to be the year of the bean. I don't know what happened, but it's fine. Um, and then I've got moringa. This is actually something I'm going to be starting to have in a pot inside. I have grow lights that I can use, uh, have it up here on the herb wall. So this is pretty stark except for this pothos that lives in here right now. Um, come winter and come fall actually. When I start to do the in and out dance with the plants, which means I bring them in at night and take them out during the day, night, back and forth until the weather is too cold for them to be outside. And I find spots for them on this wall. I particularly like to do things that we can cook with. So I will bring a bunch of, a bunch of rosemary and thyme and oregano and basil. Um, in fact, I've got basil here to start for that specific purpose to have on the herb wall. Um, and then I've got some tortilla onions, tropia onions, um, that I'm actually going to be sneaking in along the edges with these things. Uh, so these are the things that are not specifically greenhouse, uh, but I'm going to be starting. Rejects, sorry, 
um, not greenhouse seeds. They're not rejected. They just might live somewhere else. Um, I'll double check things like the beets and the carrots to see their maturity time frames, and if I can squeak them in before the final frost date for the main garden area, I will absolutely do so. So narrowing these down was difficult for me, but I did it. Um, and the reason I did it is because I had to consider space. And when I thought of things, when I looked at all of these packets and I was like, well, how am I going to choose? The answer was, well, how many things can I fit? Because that is the ultimate, you have to stop at some point. It was easy for me to consider this in terms of data from last year. Um, I am, I'm a big fan of having a lot of numbers to review. That's kind of my thing. Um, you'll see that more, I think, in the winter when we use the temperature gauge that I've got up on the herb wall as well. From the data that I gathered last winter, the north bed held heat better than the south bed, which was super cool. Um, but what that meant is I wanted to plant my more frost hardy things uh, towards the south bed. And I wanted my things that maybe needed to be coddled a little bit more in the north bed. Those are all still frost hardy, um, but mostly what I mean by that is they're taller. So I have a couple of Brussels sprouts. Um, I have a couple different kinds of broccoli, a couple different kinds of cabbages. Those are things that are going to grow up um, about a foot, maybe two feet, depending on the variety. Um, and I had to visualize those as like pillars taking up space. And because things like broccoli tend to take up a lot of space, um, I went with a variety that is um, a little bit shorter. So it was a seed packet from Johnny's and it is a hybrid mini. So I picked the hybrid mini broccoli burgundy F1. This is only supposed to grow so tall. Uh, it also says it's days to maturity is 37. So that is extra good news. Um, broccoli is funny because once you cut that main top, it'll send off side shoots. So cutting off that main top, don't assume you're done. You'll get more things. Um, but I am careful in my variety selection because I'm conscious of space. I'm conscious of how much time it will take until I get something from that crop. Uh, and then these are things that I need to start inside and move out as the season becomes ready for them. So I used my Excel document with my 17 lines for this north bed and the south bed. Um, and I basically prioritized, well, which of these things do I, am I most interested in trying? Did I have any favorites that came back from last year? Uh, the big star last year for us was bok choy. Uh, we did a bunch of different kinds of bok choy last year and they were delicious. Uh, we enjoyed those in stir fries all the time. Um, so a lot of the things that you'll see on my list are considered Asian greens um, or are really seen in those types of dishes because of their frost tolerance. So uh, I'll go to, on the list. I'll put it up on the screen for you so you can see. Um, in the north bed, uh, I did chijimisai, maybe? Chijimisai greens. Uh, I've got Chinese cabbage. This was, this Chinese cabbage was absolutely glorious when I lifted up the frost fabric um, in the mid dead of winter and saw this. It was beautiful. Uh, cabbage has no right to be as beautiful as it is for as, I don't know, as like smelly as it is when you cook it. Uh, and then I have my first, what I think of as like pillar. So both of these greens are considered extremely frost hardy. Broccoli is also frost hardy, but he's about a foot or two, two feet in the bed. So he'll be a little bit more sheltered than if I had him right up against the edge. And then I decided that I wanted celery as well as 
celeriac. I've never grown celeriac. It's listed as good for soups um, and fried uh, in that it's easy to grow. These do take a long time to get to fruition. That's totally fine. Celery can also take a while. This is the giant red variety. Uh, and then I've got giant kohlrabi. Um, I haven't seen these out in the main garden huge, but I've seen the regular kohlrabis starting to bulb. We'll get there. Then I've got broccoli rapini. Um, I feel like you either love or hate broccoli rapini. Um, it's considered to be a little bit more bitter. Uh, both of my spouse and I drink black coffee. Bitter is kind of just a flavor we enjoy. Uh, I've also got Florence fennel, Cor de Bue cabbage. Um, I picked this one specifically because it is a little more narrow variety. Uh, it shouldn't take up quite as much space as that uh, Gloria the Bicknizer or um, the red, what is that? The Napa red cabbage or so this is 70 days to maturity, which is still within my time frame of things I can start. Um, but my main reason I did this one as opposed to my other larger varieties is the size. Uh, then I come to my next pillar uh, plant because this is the this is the Waltham 29 broccoli. This is considered an heirloom. Uh, it's from 1954, uh, and it can get up to 24 or 32 inches, uh, so it will be sizable. It's another reason it's towards the center of the bed. Uh, gives it a little bit more, I don't know, cushion from the exterior airflow. Um, so I will have a couple of these uh, in the front and in the back. Uh, and then I shift to purple kohlrabis. These are going to be good. And then I'm doing rutabagas. I have not yet successfully go grown rutabagas. I started them too late last year. Um, they did not bulb up. I got good leaf production. Those were fine. Um, but that wasn't what I was hoping to get. So I've got two different types of ruta rutabagas. Uh, this one's Marianne. Um, I've got another pillar. So this is the Red Reuben Brussels Sprouts. Uh, these are going to be this beautiful purple red. Uh, where I can, I like to use varieties that are really colorful um, because when it's the dead of winter and it is ice and snow everywhere, colorful things make me really happy. So uh, Then I've got white kohlrabi and my second rutabaga type. I've got the Navone yellow. Are you Groninger? Groninger Brussels sprouts. This is listed as being ideal for first timers um, and should give me a fairly good harvest. It says it improves the flavor with cold weather, so here's hoping. Last season I had this variety out in the kennel bed and just as they were getting big enough to harvest I had like an absolute killing frost. Um, I think we got down into single digits and it they were gone. They're hardy but they're not that hardy. Next thing on my way down is the Chinese yellow heart winter choy. This was also something that when I lifted the frost fabric over the winter and I saw it made me gloriously happy. Um, it's just it's gorgeous and it's tasty. Uh, and then I have two different types of tatsoi. So um, this is, I suppose they're technically two different kinds, but um, I've got botanical interests and I've got Baker Creek. This one's listed as bok choy tatsoi, rosette, and then this one's just listed as tatsoi. Both of them are supposed to have superior cold hardiness uh, and that that completes the north bed. Um, these were all varieties that I would really like to fit, but they would at this point just be bonus crops because my space is, is too much. My space is too little. 
that's fine. <sighs> I think any any larger, and at that point, I just had a commercial greenhouse. That seems a little excessive. So, north bed complete. Uh, that was the tall plants, as well as uh, a lot of greens, a couple different root crops. Um, I might be able to sneak in some carrots, uh, but the thing to consider is carrots are root crops. Um, yes, that's true. So your actual veggie is below the ground, so you're taking up different parts of that. I don't know, the layers that you can consider with your garden beds. Um, so the, your canopy and then the shrub layer versus the ground cover versus the roots. So you can think of gardening that way. Um, but the greens on the carrots are fairly sizable. So um, I don't know that I want to brave getting carrots in there quite yet. Um, I'll leave those probably for a spring crop. That'll be fine. So then we come to the south bed. This I also did by I don't know that I I did not. So I have these two separated by their types of crop. So these are the root crops and these are the greens crops. I have them listed in order on the sheet. So I essentially tried to alternate between a root crop and a salad crop, uh, mostly to provide spacing. So I've got three different kinds of daikon radish. I have a China jade. I have Japanese wasabi. And then I have Japanese minowase. You know, I don't know. I'm already sorry. I tried. Um, daikon radish. And that one's supposed to be friggin' massive, so I'll be wild. So I am going to put all of the daikon radishes closest to the door, uh, and that is because I have had daikon radish out in the main garden when it got down to like 26. Um, and while in the early morning the greens of the radish looked really sad and wonky, um, couple hours later they were thriving so I'm putting these close to the door because they can tough that out they'll be okay uh, mixed in with those I've got corn salad which is listed as um, being not only highly nutritious but incredibly cold hardy uh, it says that it has unparalleled cold hardiness making it the perfect winter or cool season green uh, similarly, Mizuna. Um, this is, first of all, pink Mizuna, so we're back to colorful things in the winter. Um, this is something that is very highly prized for being cold hardy. So I've got this between uh, the first variety of daikons and the second variety, um, and then I'll have the third variety of daikon radish, and I will mix in sorrel and arugula. Both of these are considered cold hardy greens. Um, they have a better taste usually in cold weather. When it gets hot, they get a little bit bitter. It's fairly common. Um, and then I have this Red Beauty radish. Uh, by and large, radishes in general are cold hardy things. Um, they prefer cold hardy and it supposedly have better flavor in the sense of if you, like me, have delicate taste buds, they are less spicy. Uh, not to say not spicy, less spicy. They have a bit of a sweeter flavor to them in the cold of the winter. And then I have two different types of mustard. So I have Japanese Giant Red and I have Vibrant Ultraviolet. Uh, bright colors. Uh, mustard is a particular flavor um, so it's not quite the same as a bunch of the other greens that I have. Uh, it says it has strong sharp and almost garlicky mustard flavor um, so these are going to be something that will be fun to cook with 
uh, in the depths of winter where you don't necessarily have all of the rich flavors of summer. So then I have Black Beauty radishes. I actually have two different seed packets of this as well. Uh, these I have tried to grow in the spring and spring is a little bit fickle here. Um, if we get it, it's usually brief. Um, this year we had a weird range of like 80 degree days and um, a lot of my radishes bolted in that time frame. So they went to seed instead of forming a root. So I would love to taste these. And I think I am on my second or third year trying to get like a solid bulb. Um, so we are going to try those, try starting those this fall to get a harvest throughout the winter. Komatsuna, Old Tokyo. This is a traditional Tokyo, Japan veggie, according to the seed packet. Um, says it's dense in nutrition and has a refined flavor. Um, it's known as spinach mustard. So it can be used cooked or raw, and it has a mild spinach flavor. So the winter time is a great time to get a bunch of good nutritional things in. Um, the fact that you're growing them means that you know what was near them, uh, know what you put on them, and uh, it takes less away from it in the sense that when you purchase things at the grocery store, they've traveled for a specific amount of time to get where you're buying them, but they lose their nutritional density a little bit on their way. So when you are able to grow something, you are getting the full nutritional benefits right in your backyard or wherever you're growing. So what do we talk about? Komatsuna. Uh, and then I've got this Malaga radish, bright colors. I haven't grown that one before. I don't know what the flavor is going to be like. I am excited to try. Uh, and then I've got three different things listed as going in the same foot of space um, because I only need one of each plant. So I am going to do some cilantro, some chard, and some violas. These are edible. Um, they're beautiful. Uh, all of these, these two are colorful. And they're all cold hardy. So those I'm going to put in uh, all in the same foot. So I have it on one line on my sheet. And then I've got two similarly named things. So two different colored, a pink and a purple radish. Uh, I'm gonna put those mixed together um, because they're similarly named and similarly colored. And I think that would be a bright little Easter basket to pull out of there. So then I have moved closer to the edge of the bed um, so I decided I was going to shift into May Queen lettuce, which looks like it's going to be beautiful. Uh, it's supposed to be very cold hardy. And then I have purple top, white globe, turnip. I've got a different type of lettuce. This is Landis winter lettuce. Winter lettuce. See what I did there? Uh, and then I've got tokenashi turnips. Uh, these I haven't done before either, um, but should be very frost hardy. Turnips are more of a cold hardy season thing. And that finishes out the south bed. So all of the things in the south bed are lower growing, um, very cold tolerant, because last winter my south bed got the coldest uh, comparatively to the north bed. So... These are greenhouse items, several of which I need to start. The next step for me is going to be figuring out where their maturity dates are so that I know what I'm starting when. Um, some of them are direct sowing. So traditionally, if you're going to grow something for the root, you don't necessarily want to start it ahead of time. Um, carrots would probably be the most finicky one of those. 
Um, things like beets, you can usually get away with starting them. Um, and when the leaves are about two to four inches long, you transplant them outside. Um, that's how you multi-sow beets. Uh, there's plenty of gardeners with a lot of videos about how you multi-sow and what it is. Um, so if you're interested in that specifically, a general search would help you out. Um, but from here, I'm going to take the things that have 80 days or about there before they need to be at their maturity date, and I have to start those this week um, in order to be able to use them in the greenhouse. At this point, uh, for the outdoor garden, I can only start something that has 50 days left until it's able to harvest. So something like these radishes, they say they're mature in 18 days. I can sprinkle these anywhere in the outdoor gardens and I'll get something before the season's done. Um, yeah, all of these are radishes. These would probably be something that I can pop outside and still get a crop. Uh, beets, not all of your seed packets, and all of my seed packets have a maturity date on them. So this bull's blood beet will harvest in about 40 days, so I still have time for him. Uh, and then this avalanche beet says 50 days, so he is right at the edge of my window. Um, something like carrots, they can be anywhere between like 50 to 70 days till maturity. So I could start some carrots for the greenhouse, um, like this rainbow blend carrot says 70 to 79 days. Um, it is still able to go in the greenhouse, but not in the main garden. Something like these Parisian carrots, these are usually a little bit lower on the maturity date time frame. This coral carrot has 75 days, so he is not able to be planted outside, but I could do so in the greenhouse. But we've already discussed my space limitations. Where would I put it? You know, it's the gamble you do every year. Gamble I do every year. So, these are, this is my process for starting seeds in the fall and how I prepare for what that might mean in the winter. Um, and for me, winter gardening really has begun with the greenhouse. Um, prior to that, winter gardening was something that I would have to grow in containers in the house if I'm going to grow at all. So I was limited to what would fit on the herb wall, um, what I could put on my seed shelf downstairs. Um, this way, I have a space to go outside where I can get sun in the winter, which is super nice. Um, on more mild days, it's about 10 degrees warmer in the greenhouse than it is on the exterior of the greenhouse. Uh, so it's usually nice to be able to go out there with my like massive winter coat, take off the coat and be like, ah, feels like summer. Nice. Um, but if you are looking for how you are even going to start planning your fall or your winter season, um, then I would highly recommend that you, if you don't prefer using something like an Excel sheet or a Google Docs or Google Sheets, you can certainly just use your favorite internet browser, uh, perform a search on your area's last average fall frost, or first frost, fall frost, is what you're searching for. And then you can walk back that date um, for whatever seeds you're looking at starting. Um, check your seed packets for if it's cold hardy. Um, if you are living in a more mild area, then you will have less limitations, uh, and I salute you. But uh, for those of us that are in a cold region, uh, this is the way that I found to do it. There are still things that I can be sowing outside. I'll be doing so. Um, but for growing under cover, this is the way that I've narrowed down what I'm trying to grow. And I hope that that's helpful for you. If you're somewhere that you're growing undercover as well and you found uh, really excellent solutions that you want to share, leave it in the comments below. Thanks for coming along with me. Hello, and I'm Jess with Jess of the North. I am 
a little bit behind, depending on how you look at that, uh, for fall and winter seed starting. 